Sunday evening. We have special guest Mr. Wells or TK Tico Wells in the building here. And how are you doing today? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing really good. Getting ready to go and play some drums in a little bit. Excellent. That's right. What I'm kind of drums? In this beach. Uh, Jimbe. Okay. 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 African, West African. Oh, so you're going to Venice, Venice Beach doing that? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, we do that every weekend. Okay. Is it just you or is it a group or a band? Oh, no, no. It's a group. It's a drum circle. Okay. People Excellent. dancing, people bringing their families out, a bunch of wild drummers. Right. You know, creating the atmosphere. Um, yeah. It's more about the unity uh, than it is the, uh, the skill level over there. Right. Right. Yeah, last time I was at Venice Beach, I think was in 2018. And uh this was kind of like almost summer. And uh, it was it was great. You know, you had the you had the special kind of people there, you had the fun people, you had the whatever kind of people. I, <laughs> I will say this though, because you, you talked about this, uh, we were texting each other, and uh, I, this is one of my questions. You talk about the nonviolent communication. I definitely want to ask uh you what does that mean? So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, not trying to use that kind of communication here uh, with you on the podcast, but you know, it, it was just sad seeing how uh Venice Beach is now with all the uh homeless people and stuff like that. I mean, you know, seeing it on TV is one thing, but once you see it up and close, up close and personal, it's like wow, and it, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it's um, you know, they got a lot of tents though. Yeah. So, yeah. so you know. They're not going to get rained on and nobody's looking at them while they're sleeping. So it's a little better than being up in a, a doorway somewhere, I guess. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and they have community. It's just, it just doesn't look like the America that we, we grew up wanting and loving and aspiring to. It doesn't look like that America at all. Right. You know, and uh, I had some friends visiting uh, not too long ago, and they were like, "Whoa, this right. is Venice! Whoa, yeah, yeah." It's it's uh, it's interesting. Um, unfortunately, it, it, what's crazy too is a lot of these people. You know, these people get PhDs, master degrees. These people are very smart. These people work very hard, and they can't get a job. They can't do this. They can't do that. And uh, it's just sad, you know, now, you know, a lot of them are on drugs or, or just can't find any type of work or support. And it, it, it's 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 terrifying. Well, you know, one thing that I was thinking about, um, I saw this brother, he was talking about capitalism and what C.L. Smooth. Salute, salute, gentlemen. Hey, um, one thing this guy was talking about, and I forgot his name. He's brilliant. He was talking about what is capitalism and what does capitalism produce? Right. And one of the things that capitalism produces is homelessness. Right. You know, it also creates poverty. It produces poverty. If you look at the results of what comes out of capitalism, there's a racism, there's a harm, homelessness, there's sexism, this ism, that ism. This is part of the philosophy of of capitalism is uh, some of these side effects and greed. Greed is a big thing, man. Um, you know, um, we want punishment and reward, and mostly reward, but we want punishment in capitalism. Capitalism is a a society of punishment and reward and uh, and judgment. So. Um, you know, I wanted to come in and, and talk a little bit today about, you mentioned uh, nonviolent communication. Yes. It's something that uh, came to my awareness um, and it's, it's developed by a guy named Marshall Rosenberg who passed away a little while ago. But uh, I started looking at my communication and when he talks about violent communication, he's talking about judgments. He's talking about analyzing he's talking about diagnosing people um criticizing and labeling people and and we're all part of that it's in the fabric of our system that we judge each other 
um, and we think we're right. We think we're right because we're in a paradigm that is designed for a right and wrong paradigm. And depending on who has the power and the influence, that idea of rightness gets heard and gets implemented. So I'm really checking myself on all of my prejudices, all of my judgments, all of my analyzing of people, um, even the people that I don't like what they're doing. I realize they're only doing what they have been conditioned to do in their paradigm. So it's like wanting a person who was mentally ill to run for president doesn't make sense. Right. So when we judge these people that we look at as idiots and wonder why they don't act any better than they do, they're only doing what they've been conditioned to do. Right. Whether we like it or not. And until that conditioning transforms itself, there won't be any change. Right. That's the way I'm seeing it. Right. I I, I agree. Uh, it's just hard for me not to call a turtle a turtle. And what I mean is, Mr. Wells, it's like, you know, if you have a person that is, um, let's use this word, ignorant, mm -hmm. I try to use something to go around that word or kind of not understand their store, why they're ignorant and why they get to that place or why they get to that mind frame or action. It's very hard for me to, to not be like, OK, you're this or she's that or he's that, you know, because what I've noticed with people like that or that are so-called ignorant, they get in the way of progress or they get in the way of true evolution. And that's why I like to call things out and say what it is, because if I don't identify this problem or the cause and effect, I feel as though nothing will be accomplished. I, I, I get that. Um one thing we might look at is that what we see as a result is is the sore it's not the cause it's not the underlying um, genesis of what's going on so we see the we see the racist person shoot the black person that's the sore What caused that person to do that? Where is where is the where's the root of that? So we're looking at the surface, trying to clean up the surface. Okay, so we put Chauvin in jail, but we never stopped to go. What what was that? What caused that? Why was he sick? What is that sickness? We're still at the effect and not the cause. And so we probably won't transform anything by that, that, that model. That model hasn't worked yet. All we do is punish one person, but the root of the problem is alive and well. We didn't, we didn't touch the root. So if we see another senseless murder, uh, we shouldn't be shocked because we didn't address the murder. We just address the symptoms. Does that, does that make sense? That's, that's you know very I mean? clear. I, I, I understand. That's understood. Um, so my with, with every, with every, every kind of situation, right. Whether right. it's black on black crime, white on black crime, white on white crime, ignorance, greed, whatever, what is, what is at the, at the core? So, um, mm -hmm. With communication, we don't really have that many skills, so it's not it's not necessarily uh, that you're wrong for your expression of saying that's it right there. It's just that what tools were you given other than that? Blame, shame, criticize, judgment. What other tools were we given in this society? None. And when I started looking into nonviolent communication, I realized everybody has a need, a need 
that's not expressed as a need. Sometimes it's expressed as a complaint. Sometimes it's expressed as ill behavior. Sometimes it's expressed as giving you a compliment, but really that compliment might be trying to buy something from you, your affection, your favor, your uh, friendship. So we want those compliments. And we think that complimenting is uh, right. You even have judgments about compliments. But on one hand, that compliment is a judgment. And we like the good judgments. We don't like the quote unquote bad judgments. We want to hear, oh man, your music was so good. We don't want to hear, man, that sucked. But really they're the same thing. And we're relying on these outside stimulants, stimulants, stimulus to validate us. So let's take, for instance, black people in this country. We're looking for validation, even though we say we don't want validation. Everything we do is to validate our existence in this country. We want white people to accept us, even though we say we don't care, we need our own thing. Having our own thing is not a big enough need because it, it ain't happening. <laughs> it ain't happening. It hasn't happened. Even the most radical groups still want the validation of the larger matrix to survive. It feels safe to go along with the crowd. So communication is based on what we've already learned and it's mostly judgmental blame shame criticize the whole thing with kwame brown have you been following the kwame brown thing yes i have it's like i realized that i had drank the kool-aid that people had put out there about him that he was a bust and i had never really seen him play that much. So I started looking at videos of him and how good he was. Kwame was a decent player. Good size, good shot, uh, good defender, decent foul shooter. Uh, things just didn't come together for him like people would expect from a number one overall draft choice. But now the thing about it is he's retaliating and doing some of the same things that he's criticizing people about and I get it when we're hurt we want to punish those who hurt us so he's trying to punish Matt Barnes he's trying to punish Stephen Jackson Stephen A. Smith Skip Bayless all of these people for calling him a failure and he's not a failure to last in the NBA 12 years, 13 years, whatever, five years. Just the training camp alone, just dealing with all of the, he was 18 years old when he came into the league. We're all hurt. We've all been hurt from childhood in one way or another, from our parents, bullies at school, whatever, society at large. And our language reflects that pain. Um, so if we don't transform the language, we're never going to transform the society. Right. And hatred doesn't seem to do it. Because if I hate the person that is perpetrated on me, I'm still in the same world. I'm still living, shopping, doing business with these same people. And we either learn to elevate our ability or we continue on this roller coaster ride of destruction. Right. So how how let's take let's take Mr. Brown, Kwame Brown, for example. On the chessboard, 
what type of move was he supposed to make with all the negative flack he received from ESPN and you know whoever that, that's working for them? Uh, in in your opinion, what should he have done? Well, first of all, I'm working to eliminate as much as possible this concept of should. Okay. And so we have this thing we say, don't shoot on me. Don't shoot on me. It's not so much a should for me as what I'm learning in communication is to say something like, I have felt really disappointed and hurt by the way that I've been characterized in the media. I have a need to be um, appreciated. I have a need to be um, um, at peace for what I've done, what I achieved, what I accomplished, accomplished. And I request that people don't call me names. Look at what I've done. Right. Some some good. Some not so good, but I lasted 12 years in a very competitive industry. Right. And I made it through and I took care of my mother and I took care of my family and I took care of myself. And I'm not a negative statistic. Right. So what that eliminates is that my existence is based on your opinion of me. Right. That doesn't mean I'm not hurt. That doesn't mean I'm not saddened. That doesn't mean I'm not disappointed by what happened. But I can express it in a way that doesn't have to tear you down. Because the commentators of the world are doing a quote unquote job. It's media, it's entertainment. It's not necessary to play the game of basketball. It's yep. necessary to promote the game of basketball from a business standpoint, to make it interesting, to add conflict, to add drama to it. And it's also necessary to add content to those media outlets. But from a humanistic point of view, from a, a compassionate point of view, it's gossip. Right. And I, I do a football podcast, and I'm even confronting myself to say, how can I talk about this sport and these young men right. in a way that honors them and I'm still authentic? Right. Because these are brothers and sisters out there doing their best right? at a game on one hand, a game on an, on, on, and those who's, who've ever played, it can be a, a spiritual experience. It's a, it's a mental experience right. to, to achieve anything. And it's not easy. It's not easy. So I wish that I had looked into Kwame Brown's career before I even came to conclusions about whether he was good or bad. I didn't know. I actually didn't know. And I watched some videos. I'm like, wow, I'm watching him dunk. I'm watching him shut KD down. I'm watching him deal with Shaq. I'm watching him deal with all of these top players in the NBA and handle his business. Very cool, stoic demeanor. In good shape. Uh, I don't see bust anywhere. And I also understand that some of these commentators, this is all they know. Right. So I don't even blame them. I'm not going to bash them because this is all they know. This is as far as their communication skills have led them. Right. And for those who are now jumping on Kwame's bandwagon and saying, F this one and F that one. It's the same cycle. Right. And, and, and 
It's just that we don't have a sophisticated collective communication that's about compassion. Right. It's winning and losing, right and wrong. Uh, and usually I'm right, you're wrong. And no listening. Right. Listening is not a skill we were taught. It's not a skill that's taught in school. It's not a skill that's taught in very many places. Right. That's what I see. I, I agree. I agree. Listening is definitely not a skill uh, that it, it's taught. Um, the thing with with Kwame again, when I look at, and I'm saying this, Mr. Wills is not saying it, so 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 it's not on him. This is on me. When I look at people like uh, what's the guy's name, Charlemagne the God, and things that he's allegedly done, and that Kwame's talking about now, um, I think that's necessary. I think that's very necessary, and I say that because. If nobody speaks up for people that can't speak up for themselves and they keep rolling the perverted demonic stone down the hill and nobody wants to jump in front of it and try to stop it, at least we're going to be in the same situation we're in over and over and over again. Um, so I do appreciate certain things when he does things like that. And also what I've noticed with certain people, you talked about the communication thing. Let's take uh, Stephen A. Jackson, for example. I don't know his whole rap sheet, nor do I care. Stephen A. Jackson or Stephen A. Smith? I'm sorry, Stephen A. Smith. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, thank you for correcting me. Um, I don't know his whole resume and all that, but I will say this. It's not balance. He's only going to talk about certain people, right? And then he's not going to talk about the other side. If he was talking about everybody else, women, men, white people black people orange people whatever i'd be like cool that's just who he is but if a human being is always just all you know always pointing the finger at us uh, just one thing and not looking at the whole picture i have to question who sent you what's your agenda and what's your role in in this whole perverted state i like i, I like to use that word because i think everything is distorted and perverted personally uh and by the choice of choice of humans us no matter what race but us we choose to do this mess um I'm just saying, like, I, I appreciate that he's calling this out at least. Well, what are, what are his what's his skill set and what are his other choices? Um, you talking about Kwame or um, uh, C.B. Smith? Any of them. Um, Kwame, let's talk. Let's start with Kwame. Um, well, I knew him. For, I, I, I haven't watched sports really since 2007. So I just want to put that out there to everybody. I haven't been watching it. Yeah, I, I, this is before the Kaepernick thing. I haven't been watching that stuff because I never under, understood why you wouldn't watch a bunch of people run up and down. The field <laughs> like that. I, I don't I don't get it. And then they, they, they get treated like crap. I, I don't understand that. And then people talk about this black power stuff and all this kind of stuff. But um. But then they want to work for people that don't like them, but they it, it doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to get in that right now. Uh, but the thing I do know about Kwame, he, he was an NBA. They said he was a person that had all the potential in the world. He didn't meet to his requirements and stuff like that. But I'm just saying, like, from what I have seen, he's done a pretty average OK job to me. I mean, that's just me. Um, he's no to me. He's no different than. um uh hardaway or anybody else i mean that's just my again again that's just my opinion so i don't know why he's getting all the flack i can say this um he's speaking his mind and he's saying some things that needs to be said that a lot of men that call themselves men need to be doing you want me to respond to that Yes, sir. You have kids? No, sir. But you were a kid yes. at one point. Yes. Did you ever do anything that you wish you hadn't have done or you look back and go, ah, I'm not too happy about that? Yes. What if every time you did something that you weren't happy about, you got canceled 
as a valuable human being. So on, on one hand, I got to see how vulnerable I am to the media by thinking Kwame was a bust without having seen his work. And upon seeing his work, I realized I was ignorant. Not bad, just I didn't know. And I was making judgments on something I had no information about. So I get that part. Somebody talking about him, talking about he's a bust for 20 years. Now, that doesn't make him a perfect person because he was talked about. That doesn't make him a person who doesn't have anything in his life that he wish he hadn't have done. Because I'm sure there's all of us wish there were certain things that we hadn't done and we're not happy. We're not, we don't feel good about. So just by pointing out somebody's flaws, it doesn't make you a better person, nor does it necessarily help that person to become a better person. A lot of times it creates more drama and conflict and heartache because what's missing is the element of compassion. What's missing is the element of, you know, you know how people say, don't act like your shit don't stink. Right. So that's what we all get involved in when we start pointing fingers a lot of times is we do it in a way not to uplift the world, but to put ourselves on a pedestal. Right. And now you've hurt another person on top of all the other people that have been hurt instead of saying, let's come together. Let's sit down in a tribunal. Right. And create healing for everybody involved so we can all grow because none of us are infallible. None of us are without flaw. In the Christian world, they say none of us are without sin. However, sometimes we get our egos get out there like we can talk about people in a way that, myself included, that points a finger at them, but there's really no love there. Right. And I, I don't, and that's why I'm studying communication because, and particularly nonviolent communication. Right. Because is Kwame better than Charlemagne? I mean, I would say yes. <laughs> I mean, that's. <laughs> so then that puts you in a position of the God figure where you can judge us that makes you the overseer of right and wrong, that makes you, that puts you in a position of, of judgment. Not to say that <clears throat> that's right or wrong either. Right. It's all we've been taught. Right. All we know is judgment. The Bible talks all about don't judge and it's nothing but a book about judgment. Right. So, I can not like a person's actions, but I'm no better than anybody on this planet. Right. Take the worst person you can think of. I'm not better than them. I might be different from them. Right. I'm not better than no gangbanger. I'm not better than no criminal. I'm not better than no saint. I'm not better than anyone. I'm just me. Living on this sphere that we call or sphere, flat earth, oblong, oval, I don't know what shape it is, uh, out in some mystical universe floating in the atmosphere, I don't know what this life is. I only have stories about philosophies about what it is. I actually don't know what it is. Right. 
that something's spinning and turning and all these creatures are on this planet and different weather patterns and, and different textures of earth, water, soil, wind, fire. I don't know what this thing is. Who the hell am I to say, uh, you know, people want, want me to get into a Palestinian uh, Jewish uh, debate about who's right and who's wrong. To me, they're cousins. They're fighting cousins. We're all ignorant. We're all ignorant. Thinking that we are so above everything because we go to a little school here and there or we get some degrees. We don't know Jack. We don't know Jack and we're all arrogant. All of us have layers of arrogance that's out of this world. You know, and we're judgmental. That's just what we are. That's what we teach. That's what we preach. That's what we continue to perpetrate on each other. It's like, you know, the Crips and the Bloods. Oh, you shot my cousin. Oh, you, yeah, well, well now you shot us. We're going to shoot back at you. They're cousins. When Nipsey Hussle died, Crips who live across the street from Bloods who are related to each other had an opportunity to come together and say, damn, man, I love you. I ain't talked to you in so many years because you wear red and I wear blue. Who's right, the Crips or the Bloods? Why are, what, makes, what makes you or me the author of correctness? You know, everything that I've learned, I got from other people. I didn't even invent nothing. I didn't invent acting. I didn't invent football. I didn't invent interviews. I didn't invent what I eat. I got everything that I got from somebody else and they got it from somewhere else. So we are riding all high and mighty. And if I could talk to Kwame, I would say, I feel your concern about what people have said about you. And that hurt doesn't make you better than anyone else just because you were hurt. None of us, I don't care what happens to us, does not make us better than anyone else in my view of life. I'm not better than white people. White people are not better than me. I'm not better than Chinese people. All my life growing up, people talked about, oh, that's an Asian behind the wheel. You know they can't drive. <laughs> that's the dumbest thing in the world. My whole life. Oh, you know how women are. They can't drive. That, it makes no sense. And I'm having to find a whole new level of compassion just to be on this planet because all I do is read and research and watch uh, documentary videos, informational videos, and collect information that by the time I collect it and try to share it, I'm a lunatic to people. All they can think of is, are you going to do another five heartbeats? They don't want to hear about my research in how to cure cancer, how to heal heart problems, how to clean up their temple. They don't want to hear that shit. Or they think it's cool. Oh, yeah, the brother's talking. He's talking some deep stuff, man. But, it does, you know, it ain't going to move people most of the time. When I was eight years old, I begged my mother to stop smoking cigarettes. She promised me for my eighth birthday that she would stop smoking cigarettes. It wasn't until she was 54 years old and she had a heart attack that she stopped cold turkey. And then I told her, I said, Mom, I cured myself of heart condition, of a heart condition. I might be able to help you. You think she could get in alignment with that? Hell no. You're not a doctor. You don't know what you're talking about. I said, well, mom, I, I healed my, my condition. 
had to change some dietary things, had to uh, use some of the, the information that I've learned about Mother Nature and plant healing and herbs and things like that. But I did. Right. She didn't want to hear that. Mm. She's a college educated woman. woman. So what'd she do? She went to some guy, let her, let him cut her chest open, cut her leg open, pull out a little vein in her leg and try to fit that in her heart. Now I'm not God. I don't know if leg veins belong in heart where heart veins go. I don't know. She got a good five years out of it. So bless her. Bless her. That was her choice. And I had to learn to not be attached to it. Because I was attached. I was ju I was judgmental. I'm telling you, I know how to do something, but you can't hear it. So I can't call her stupid, but I can say I have compassion because that's how she was conditioned. When she grew up, if you were a preacher or a doctor, you were next to Jesus. It don't matter how many lives you healed or destroyed. You were Jesus if you had an MD or a cloth. That's just how she was raised. That was the consciousness. So somebody like Dr. Fauci come on TV, people don't know him. We don't question scientists. We're not taught to question science. Science is the next is the is the other religion. Yeah. So yeah. if a scientist said it, it must be true because he's a scientist. It doesn't matter that all his colleagues disagree with him. He had the national platform. He said it, and people right. blindly followed. Can I get mad at them? Does that make me better than them? Does that make me right? No. Right. No. Doesn't make me right. They can do what they want to do. Right. So... I've had problems with Charlemagne's attitude. Can I've had talk, judgments about him. Can you talk about what situations you're talking about and what, what he's done in terms of his attitude? Because I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, even before this Kwame Brown thing, um, I don't support the dude at all. I'm, I mean, real talk, I, I don't. And I've, I've been saying this since two. I think oh. that he's <laughs> trying to grow, but prior to him growing, he was a representative of most of our world that think that they know what people should be doing. Okay. And he represented the judgmental mindset of our world. Right. He was just a reflection of it. Okay. And we got to see the ugliness that that reflection has. Right. Through him. Right. That doesn't mean I'm not judgmental because I'm judging him. He can only use the skills that he has. When Birdman came in there and said, put some respect on my name, I could see his hurt. He was like Kwame Brown. Y'all talking about me and it doesn't feel good. And y'all don't even know me. It was hurt. Now, he did it in a gangster way. He got his message out there. I don't know if the problem was solved. Because we've been taught that if you have a radio show, a talk show, you can just trash on people's lives. And talk about people his donkey of the day who the hell is he to call somebody a donkey who is Charlemagne to call somebody a donkey
but in one respect is no different than you know people uh, talking about the presidents the, the Democrats hate the Republicans and the Republicans hate the Democrats what's the difference right it's the same thing they don't come together right they don't come together because it's they're not taught to come together. They're taught to argue. They're taught to be at odds with each other, even though they're doing the same damn thing. More taxes, more war, more deficit, more crime, more greed, over and 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 over. Right. So we have an opportunity now to find out what is how do we how do we transform this i got a lot of family members who are like long as i got my paper long as i'm good inside my house i'm good they don't want nothing to do with nothing but when they see somebody like george floyd on tv they go oh that's a shame and we're all in that boat because we actually don't know how to transform the world. And it's not a daily thought for most of us. Most of us don't activate that Christ nature inside of us, that Buddha nature, that, that illumination. We don't activate it. We settle for mediocrity as a standard. And I understand that, I get that. It's scary. I'm so terrified sometimes of trying to share stuff with people that I've been taught by my masters, and I say masters in the sense of my, my mentors and teachers right? Um, who taught me about health and taught me about business and taught me about life. And, and, and I'm still learning, I'm still growing, I'm still it's a lifestyle to grow. Right. And I'm not, from the world's perspective, a perfect person. So I throw that, ter that term out, perfect. I'm not perfect. Right. What is that anyway? My, my intention is to be authentic. My intention is to make a difference in the world. My intention is to be a value to this universe right that's that's what motivates me and um, I have an extreme amount of desire to express what I've learned about the human body and health and how to take care of ourselves and I don't know how to do it I really don't know how to do it. But, you know, I want to read you something that okay. I came across many years ago. And I, wrote, I read it again today. Um, I think I told you about this book last time, didn't I? Yes, yes, yes. The Doctrine of Truth, yes. This book is going for over $100 now, Kulik. Right. Because it's out of print. Right. This is food for thought. See, my teacher in college told me, my, one of my vocal teachers told me, everybody knows something, but nobody knows everything. And that's most of what I remember about her class, is her saying right. that. Everybody knows something, but nobody knows everything. None of us. Um, so people are always skeptical about, well, well, you know, so-and-so, that's a conspiracy theory. Well, you know, they, they, they want to vet anything that's not the normal matrix. They want to vet that as hard as they can. Right. But if it's in the mainstream, they don't ask no questions. Right. They don't ask any questions. You could tell them it came from a bat, a green turtle, a green turd. Right. As long as it's coming from... CNN or Fox, whatever your choice is, it's real. It's right. reality. Right. This book talks about fruit. Fruit. 
fruit. We have a smiley face about fruit, but we don't really know the depth of what fruit is to the human being. He says, fruits of all kind. Can I read this? Yes, 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 yes. It says, fruits of all kind are the true and natural solid foods of man as supplements to air and water principally a source of pure water and sugar. Fruits are the seed bearing pods and seeds of all plants, including citrus, apples, pears, peaches, plums, tomatoes, melons, squash, cucumbers, grapes, seeds, corn, nuts, grains, bananas, peas, beans, pineapples, berries, figs, dates, coconuts, avocados, green peppers, okra, eggplant, papaya, and many more. And from this great variety of succulent and nutri nutrient-filled plant products, a thorough and well-balanced diet can be easily prepared, permitting a wide variety of choices and combinations for each meal. Some of these, such as peas, beans, peppers, okra, eggplant, squash, and cucumbers are generally thought of as vegetables, but must be truly classified in the fruit family. A diet of fruit in the proper combinations and quantity as a part of the formula for health of life will guarantee a person a life of radiant health, free from all disease. The vegetables may be added as supplements to a fruit diet in order to provide their excellent nutrients and offer more variety of diet. Eat abundantly of fresh fruits, and I would say fresh organic fruits. Right. What do you What do you hear? I hear from that. Um, for a healthy, balanced body, if you will, we have to. And I don't. I don't want to say we have to, but it's suggested that one should eat something that will give you nourishment and communication proper dna healing um and just overall just 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 proper ingredients that we need you know eating these um fast food hamburgers and fast food this and fast food that instant gratification it just doesn't work out for our overall being so the fruit really puts us in connection back to the earth's balance rotation earth's communication you know and Fruit is a communication source. Mm. Mm. That's how I see it. Yeah, I like that communication source. It's simple. Yes. And whenever I go to Jamaica, and it's changing, but whenever I go to Jamaica, I see these people who some of the poorest of them, quote unquote, poorest, because that's a judgment. That's a judgment. Don't eat a lot. Hmm. They may grab a banana, some fruit, some coconut. They may they may have some dinner with some peas and rice and a little goat. They're not eating all day. Sometimes they don't eat much at all. They don't go to the gym. They walk a lot. They're outside a lot and they're ripped. These Jamaican folks are ripped until they get into eating too much and eating the wrong things. Right. Like when McDonald's shows up in Jamaica and they think that that's what you do to be cool, to right. be wealthy, to be American-like, because a lot of them, as much as they have Jamaican pride, they really don't always feel a sense of self-worth because the world has constantly told them that they're poor and that they speak some bastardized version of English. But these people are strong 
I don't see a lot of hospitals in Jamaica. Because most of the people don't, they're not sickly. Right. Right. Yeah. I, 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 I've, I've seen, now I've never been to, to Jamaica, but I've seen that in documents or, 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 or videos where it's like, you know, these people will live a certain lifestyle and they live to a hundred and something years old. You know, like you said, they're ripped. Um, they're, they're sharp as a whistle or sharp as a knife um, mentally. And um, that diet is, is, is key to a lot of things because what we ingest in our bodies and how we um, just live our life nowadays as Americans is, is very, um, not to put any labels or anything, but it's, it's very um, uh, 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 demonic. Uh, so, you know, you, you get in what you get out, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Uh, well, let's look at reality. What is reality? Reality might be said to be an agreement on space and time. Space and maybe another element, space, uh, dimension and time. Right. We agree on what it is. Right. It's an agreement. Right. But it's not really a natural truth. So take a pandemic. What is a pandemic? It's an authority figure or body of authority organizations that control the reality of the people declaring that something is so wrong we are taking over your life like what is the measurement yeah yeah so uh, another social media thing and, and things i like to talk about too uh, I don't know if you're friends with uh, her or know her uh, personally, uh, but the uh, comedian Monique, did you see her recent uh, video she did? In a car? I think, yeah, she was in a room. She was talking about uh, some women that are wearing, are coming out the house wearing uh, certain things that make them look, uh, yes, 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 yes. The, the bonnets and, and, and the pajamas and all, you know, the, 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 the wear that makes you look not as presentable. Uh, what would you think about that, uh, Mr. Will? Once again, we go back to reality. Who gets to decide what reality is? What's the difference between a pair of underwear and swimming trunks? Right. What's the difference? They ca they, if they cover the same amount of area, a bra or something for women on top and something panties on the bottom, right. some are called underwear and some are called swimwear right what what the hell is the difference none of us were born with clothes on so we are trained through walls through uh, madison avenue what is considered appropriate attire right so even when people talk about uh, men shouldn't have their pants sagging down who am i to tell another man to pull his pants up or let him fall down. If he likes that style, why am I bothered? But is that a good representation of, I don't want to say your race, but who or what your community is? So in other words, if our women go outside, when I say our women, I'm talking about so-called black women, go outside and they have their breast out and their butt out, and I hear you, Mr. Wills, but it's like, is, is that, is that safe? Is that, is that, is that, is that, is that presentable? Is that respectful? You know, I'm not saying I should decide whatever, but if you're putting yourself in a certain situation and you don't expect flack from it, this is what life is. It's, it's give, it's tug, it's go, it's cause and effect, it's, it's push, it's pull. So, me coming on this show talking about some of the stuff I'm talking about. Yeah. For some people will be, this fool is crazy. 
Give me all the drugs, all the poisons that modern society has for me. I'm cool. Yeah. Forget all that eating nuts and fruits and stuff. So as far as wardrobe is concerned, from what I can tell, everyone's born naked. Yes. It was society that deemed certain parts of the anatomy as inappropriate. Right. I remember growing up looking at National Geographic. They had no problem showing black women with their breasts out. Facts. Facts. In their culture, that is not an offensible or reprehensible behavior. Right. In this culture, which prides itself on everybody knowing the norm, the appropriateness, we judge the hell out of everything. And a lot of stuff that makes could make a difference, and sometimes it doesn't make a difference. The NFL used to have this thing where you can't you can't make your helmet look different from other players. You can't put designer tape on there. Then all of a sudden it changed, and now they got certain days where the players have their charities or whatever they want on their cleats. Right. Everybody's got different cleats. Right. So reality is an agreement within our society. In Monique's reality, that is inappropriate. But as much as I, I love and care about Monique, that does not make her the goddess of correctness, nor does it make me the goddess god of correctness. We talk about freedom in this country. Are, we, are they not free to wear their stuff like they want to wear them? They can. They Why can. does it, it? It doesn't. My race cannot reflect me because I'm I'm still growing. They don't know what I am. Just because someone's black doesn't mean they represent Tico Wells. People wear a suit as a sign of dignity. You know how many criminals wear suits? Right. And ties? How many countries have been taken? How many assassinations have been committed with somebody wearing an appropriate attire? Right. It's, 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 it, it has no bearing on a person's consciousness. Let's get to a person's consciousness. Is this outfit made? They feel comfortable, obviously, right. to wear right. the uh, shower caps and all that. I don't know if that's what she was talking about. I didn't yeah. get deep into what she was talking about, but shower it. caps and stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm sporting a beard right now. You know, this is my COVID beard, so to speak. No, I'm not even going to call it that. This is my beard. I just started letting it grow. I ain't go to the barber and cut it. Does that make me unkempt? No. Many times people have said, hey, you're going to color that? How is that going to affect your career? You're going to color that white? I'm 60 years old, man. I could care less about what people think of the fact that I'm no longer that 29-year-old kid who played choir boy in the five heartbeats. That's not who I am at this point in my life. I continue to morph and evolve. So we're still in the stone ages in consciousness of not understanding the concept of helping each other to express our own uniqueness and at the same time developing methods so that we can live in harmony. I understand when people say this doesn't represent us well because the ego, the collective ego is looking for validation from someone. Right. Black people are looking for validation from white people to this day. And that's where the whole idea possibly comes from of this doesn't look right. It ain't to the black folk that they're saying that to. 
It ain't to the black people that they're saying that to. It's to those that they think are judging them. Right. Which is, I guess, well-to-do blacks and white folks. Right. They're not saying, I don't care what Chinese people say necessarily. They're not saying, I don't, uh, I, I'm worried about what the Asian community or the Latino community are thinking about me. We are still post-traumatic slave syndrome as African-Americans. But it's the same thing as the uh, egotistic, self-aware, self-conscious mentality of the world. We're all worried about what we look like, what we somebody's going to think about us because we're not free. Right. We're not free. We're not free to be ourselves. We want to know what does that look like? Is my ass big enough? Is, is, do I have the right haircut? Do I have the right car? Floyd Mayweather really inspires me to look at my my ego. Okay. Because when I hear Floyd talk a lot of times, it makes me think, when have we made it? Right. Is it 10 billion? 20 billion? Right. 200 billion? Does that mean we've made it? I haven't seen anyone who so-called is after money, after fame, after making it, be satisfied. Right. When do we arrive? That's, that's, a, that's a choice that we have to go within and say, I am at peace with who I am right now. Right. I forgive myself for the past, anything that... I'm not totally happy with. I forgive myself for the future, for anything I don't achieve that I thought I wanted to achieve. And I forgive myself now for not always feeling worthy of just being a human being alive. Right. I am worthy, not because of what I've done, not because of what I've earned, because right. I declare it as a choice right in this moment i declare that everything is working out for me and everything is working out for humanity do i have evidence of that being true i'm not looking for evidence i'm not looking for validation i'm making a declaration that i am whole and complete as i sit here in this moment right talking to you it does not matter that this is not CNN, that this is not uh, some billion dollar network. We're right. having a conversation and we're getting to communicate. Someone will hear this and possibly be able to add something, take something away, uh, or totally dismiss it. Yes, 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 y'all. Um, I'm going to open the phone lines here. If you have any questions or comments for Mr. Wells, the phone line is open. The number is 512-655-9848. Again, it is 512-655-9848. And let me put this here so you guys can see the phone lines open. So call now for a question or comment to Mr. Wells here. And uh, yes, so. Can you give that slow to anybody out there who may not be able to see? but can hear your voice. What's that? The phone number. Oh, okay. So the number is 512-655-9848. Again, y'all, that is 512-655-9848. Excuse me. Call in, call in now for a question or comment to uh, Mr. Tico Wales right now. And it's funny. The reason why I, I asked if you could say it slow, because I would on occasion run into Stevie Wonder 
Right. And every time I would run into him, I would go into this long monologue about who I am so that he could remember who I was. Hmm. And one day it was like Stevie just got tired of that. And he was like, yeah, you so-and-so, you know so-and-so, you're friends with so-and-so and blah, 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 blah. You did this, that, blah, blah, blah. And he ran down this, my whole thing or whatever. Right. And it hit me in that moment. He's blind. He doesn't have Alzheimer's. Right. And so I gained a, a, a whole awareness of people's different challenges and abilities. Right. From Stevie Wonder in that moment. Now, have you, memory is incredible, incredible, right. right? Incredible. Yeah, I had just missed him uh, at an audio engineering event. Uh, he was at um, the one in uh, Nashville, and I was told he just left because he likes going to the um, uh, uh, NAMS and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So I had just missed him, and I was like, "Dang, I, you know." Um, have you ever done any type of projects with? Uh, uh, Steve Wonder or anything like that? Because I know, again, if y'all don't know, Tico Wells is a singer too and a, a musician. So, yes. We did a tribute to, oh my God, I can't remember if it, somebody passed away. It may have been David Ruffin or one of the Temptations, Eddie okay. Kendricks. Somebody had passed away and we were at the Will Turn Theater in Hollywood and some of the five heartbeats were on stage and Stevie and a lot of other musicians and stuff were, uh, were on stage and we got to perform together and sing a song. Uh, I don't even remember what the event was. It's so long ago now. Okay. But that, and one time I was um, at a taping for the Bill Cosby show and Stevie had a part on the show, and I got to see him and interact a little bit um, right. at that time. But um, I've met him, met his brother. Don't know him well, but um, he's always been an inspiration to so many people. And uh, uh, when they were trying, they were building a campaign to make Martin Luther King's birthday a national holiday. I was in college in Maryland at Bowie State College, college at the time, it's university now. And we went downtown and he had uh, a big rally uh, to make Martin Luther King's birthday a holiday. And it was freezing out there. Right. But it was just thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And um, he just inspired me to know that an artist can be a conscious person, not only through his art, but through relating and learning other aspects of the human experience. Right. Sometimes we're, we're labeled that we're just our artists. Shut up and dribble. Shut right. up and sing. Right. But we're, we're, we're people. Right. Uh, and, and for me, so any type of celebrity that I've gained only gives me a platform for people to hear. Right. It doesn't mean I'm anything different or better than anybody else. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. They think when you are an artist or an actor or whatever, that you're different. You go to the bathroom, you wake up, you eat, you have problems, you have families, you have dysfunctionalities, you have victories, you have disappointments. And people put, want to put you on a pedestal. Right. And... Um, everybody's some type of being you know some people say there's clones on the planet some people say there's you know uh you know people who are not real uh i i don't know i don't know all of what's here right you know but uh uh i'm having fun though i'm having fun even though it's challenging man this life is challenging Right. Yes. Challenging. Is anybody yeah. out there? Anybody listening? Is this live? What's up? Yes, we're we're live here. We're Mr. Wells, the phone lines are open. The number, I'm going to say it slowly for y'all. The number is 512-655-9848. Call in now. We are live. Questions or comments to Tico Wells here. Um, another question I have, too, since we're on the music thing. Um, 
one, what music projects are you working on now? And out in California, what studios have you recorded at? <sighs> right now, I'm training myself to be a guitarist. Okay. Um, I've always had a love of all kinds of musical instruments. Um, just picked up the guitar again after many years of not touching it. Um, and I'm also studying the African, West African djembe. And uh, I've been doing various live performances in the last couple of months. I was in Mount Shasta in April. I was just in Big Bear last week uh, for two nights um, playing with the djembe group. Um, and I haven't done any recording this year. Um, and I really am sort of on a grassroots level getting back into music more for fun than to have it as a career. Got it. Um, I started off in the eighties before I did the five heartbeats wanting to record and at one time I had a, a, a deal with Polygram. I had done a, a single uh, a Sly Stone's Family Affair. And uh, with, uh, and uh, went through the whole thing in the late 80s and early 90s of trying to knock down the doors of getting in the music business. And I wasn't very successful at it. Um, written songs. Um, and kind of gave up on it in the 90s, but it was always in my heart. And now I'm coming back to music for enjoyment, for the right. pure love of it. Right. And it feels good. It right. Feels really good. I, I performed with Larry Dunn of Earth, Wind & Fire um, back in 2013 and 14, and I hurt my ear performing on stage. Uh, how how sound system. The sound system popped in my ear. I had these little monitors, ear plugs in my ear. Yes, in your mind. It turned on the uh, sound system and it popped. Wow. And it, 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 it damaged a little bit of my hearing. And it was one of the worst shows of my life, man. I couldn't hear nothing. Wow. And I'm trying to harmonize with these people doing Earth, Wind, and Fire tunes. Are you kidding? Right. <sighs> nothing but harmonies, man. Right. And it was, it was, it was rough. And it's funny because... Uh, Larry Dunn, he was like, uh, some of the people in the band was like, probably Tico was nervous, man. I was, I was not nervous, believe me. I've been on stage since I was four years old. Right. Doing all kinds of stuff. So it wasn't nerves. It was, I, I had gotten injured. Right. And I performed with them a little bit. And then I, I decided that that loud band music was too loud. And my hearing was number one. Right. So I, I left the group and... Um, started trying to heal my, my ear. Luckily, I still have hearing. but uh, And I, I, I started to do a lawsuit and everything and didn't really have a good attorney. And anyway, but um, I still can hear. And right. I've been coming back. I've been coming back to, to music and, and singing. And, um, and, uh, as far as acting goes, I just did a film in Texas, Houston, Texas, with some beautiful people. Good H friend of mine named Shadrach, huh? I said H Town, H Town, H Town, H Town. Yeah, H -town. we did a move. Um, look out for a movie called The Prodigal Son. The Prodigal Son, okay. Yeah, with uh, starring Shadrach Anderson, which is a great friend of mine, actor, musician, entrepreneur. He's 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 a great person. Um, and met some great people down in Houston, man, you know, who are saying, listen, let's do it ourselves. Let's pool our monies together. Shout out to uh, the boss chicks of, um, of Houston. Uh, <laughs> the boss chicks of Houston, look them up. Some okay. Beautiful <laughs> sisters. Uh, the boss chicks. Entrepreneurs. And they all had a part in the movie, too. But, uh, yeah. Um, and uh, produced by Jeffrey Taylor. And uh, so um, I'm at a point in my life where I'm just enjoying 
Okay, we have a call coming in now. Uh, let me see here one second. Yes, caller, how you doing there? Uh, yes, brother Coolidge, how you doing? Doing good, doing good. What's your question or comment for uh, Mr. Wells here? Uh, Mr. Wells, um, I just had a question on um, Hollywood. Um, do you see Hollywood changing, and are you you still have the uh, itch to get back into Hollywood? Um, first of all, when you say Hollywood, what do you mean? Um, like the movie industry, and it seems to be kind of changing a bit, like, even after all of this, uh, Corona, or oh, I'm sorry, all of this, uh, virus stuff. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can answer that. Um. I live in Los Angeles. Uh, some people consider this Hollywood. Uh, I never. I've been here for thirty-one year for thirty years. Thirty-one years. Um, I just finished a film. Um, I do voiceovers. I do music. Um, I do commercials. I do um, documentaries. Um, uh, I teach acting, coach acting, so uh, I don't have a studio contract with any big studio or anything, um, but uh, because sometimes people don't see people as regularly, they think that the person went somewhere or left. Uh, it's not always like that. It's either you create projects for yourself or you're um, looking to attract projects that uh, you can be in or be a part of. So I never left Hollywood. I've always been available. If someone um, wants to collaborate with me or utilize my talent and my skill, um, but I'm not dependent on Hollywood for my livelihood, for my validation. I was an actor when I grew up in D.C. I was an actor in New York. Um, I continue to have that ability. And, um, you know, um, I have not left. The five money traps that keep you poor. Yes, yes. So I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, yes, yes, brother. Well, it, it, yeah, and it, you said it, something about what are changing I in Hollywood. To, uh, probe the it, I was just asking. You know. What was the second part of what you said? Something about how how it's changed or something. Well, it just seems like it's a lot of lot more. Um, I don't know about independent, but it's. It doesn't seem to have that same production that it used to be back in the day. I mean, I, I understand things change, but well, seeing... we we're in the digital age where people can buy a, a camera that's digital that has high quality. You know, if you've seen these new iPhones and and uh, Androids, the cameras on them these days, the the the, the sharpness is amazing. So you have people, young people coming up all the time in this new era, and they're coming out of film schools, they're coming from wherever they're coming around the country, and they're, sh they're, they're taking a shot and just putting together with whatever money they can muster up and, and making films. And so uh, Netflix needs content, Hulu needs conf content, um, you know, uh, all these other streaming sources need content. So quality may change and shift because if someone if netflix says i can buy all of these i can buy 10 black films for a million dollars and i can only buy one film that was made by a studio for that i'm gonna take the 10 just for content basis so it's a business. So if we don't care about the quality, why should they care? If we're going to watch it just because it's black, 
They say, hey, they're still watching it. We need content. Let's go. The beautiful side of it is that young people and anybody who wants to make a film can make a film these days for very little. Now, are people going to learn the craft, learn to make it excellent, learn to tell a human story in a way that's compelling? I don't know. You know, there's only a certain amount of people that want excellence in life. Most people are aiming for mediocrity. So you're going to have a lot of films that are mediocre or below mediocre, and a few are going to slip through that are just excellent. You know, when I saw 13th, I was like, this girl, Ava DuVernay, is a bad motor scooter, man. She's a bad motor scooter. You know, so I hope that answers your question. You know, it, you know yes, 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 in some way. You know, answer my question. What do you do? Are you in the industry? That's what I was looking for. Um, right now, I'm in transition. I'm trying to uh, actually open my own business. Um, so I'm trying to make my steps to do that right now. What you What you doing? Dispensaries? No, I would. I would like I would like to at some point, but <laughs> but I live in Georgia right now, so uh, <laughs> but I have talked about that for years. <laughs> but um, hey, man, it's, it's, <laughs> go to Colorado, man. Go to because uh, go because I always DC. I always used to say to my um, friends and family, you know, um, there's a lot of when we were going through prohibition, they were black uh um you know alcohol makers and stuff like that now we <laughs> you don't have none <laughs> so we have to try to get into those those industries that like you say that might kind of scare us off we have to make those steps to get there what type of business are you are you doing can you say um well i'm i'm transit i used to have a sneaker business but i had a, a house fire <laughs> and that so I had to start all over, basically. So right now I'm trying to transition into doing T-shirts since I'm, you know, kind of into fashion and stuff like that. Okay. Into sneakers and things like that of that nature. But but I am trying to angle my fashion into the world of uh, dispensaries, if 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 you will. <laughs> It's uh, the even the CBD is the CBD big down there. Yes, that's yes, that's the big thing out out in um in Georgia right now because it's of course it's legal. Okay, well, now what's your what's your what's your background in business? Um, I'm I'm amateur. <laughs> I'm amateur as well. I um, I just been in the corporate world. So I'm, How old are you? I didn't like a, oh, uh, I'm uh, 40. 40, okay. Have you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? I'm sorry? Have you ever heard of Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Uh, Is that a book? <laughs> yep. Go on YouTube yes, and get the it. audio book. It's called Rich Dad, yes. Poor, Rich Dad. Poor Dad. Yes, I have, I have heard of that. Yes. Okay, they got the audio book on YouTube. You might want to check that okay. out. It's it's not like real academic. It's like a story about somebody's life and understanding how business works. Correct. And it's, it's helped That's me out. A lot. Thing. We haven't. We don't. We don't. Uh, we don't try to teach that to our. We don't try to pass that on. It's like a. It's like the hidden secret. Like because I've had family members that had businesses, but. <laughs> You ask some questions, it's like, you know, they give you a little piece here and a little piece there. <laughs> well, a lot of people don't have communication skills. You know what I mean? A lot of people don't aren't, aren't masters of communication. And sometimes people may not be doing things above board and they don't want you to know too much. I don't know. Uh, but it's up to each individual to seek it out. Yeah. What what does it take? And yeah, that's true because I'm I, I'm trying to I'm just doing it step by step. 
So <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. I, go, I go in there blind. <laughs> yeah, get you some mentors and definitely get that audio book. Unless you like to read, get the book. No, I, I, I would definitely uh, buy that book. I, I, like I said, I've heard of it before. I've, you know, in passing conversation, I've heard of it. That book. Are you a reader or, or, or you like to take stuff in audio? Um, I'm, I'm a reader, but I, I'm, I mean, I do, I'm, I do a little bit of both, but I, I like to read. Okay. And especially if it's you know, something that captures, you know, my attention. You'll love, you might love this book. You might love this book. I loved it. I've read all, almost all his books. Robert Kiyosaki is his name. I read almost all his books and it's really helped me in business. Okay. How to think and what America is. America is based on a financial concept and a, on, on debt. It's really based on debt. So all yeah. business is debt based, even though it doesn't seem like it. When you make money, you're really not making money. You're managing uh, debt because all money in, in this country is debt to the Federal Reserve. Did you know that? Yes. Um, you did? Yes. I'm, uh, yes, I'm being, I'm, uh, without saying too much, I, I'm, I, I follow some of the outside channels, that, if, you, if you will, <laughs> not listening to the mainstream media. So, yes, I, um, since through this past election and stuff like that, I've really been educating myself on this country. <laughs> It's a trip, isn't it? Oh, yeah. oh man, it's <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's crazy the information I found out within the last two years, really. I mean, and you have to kind of search it out because, again, <laughs> they try to hide it, but it's out. Well, there. <laughs> you know, you said something that that I wanted to comment on. You said they don't teach us that, or they don't want us to know that. It's up to us to push ourselves forward to become sup the super beings that we really are. It's no one else's responsibility to make the magic that you have inside of you to come alive. And I loved um, when um, Napoleon Hill said, you have to have a chief definite aim in life. And basically, you know, some people call them goals or whatever, but what we think of, we can manifest, and we've proven it to ourselves over and over and over again. You think about somebody, and all of a sudden they call, or you haven't thought about somebody in a long time, and then you hear from them. So you are magic. There's some magic that you have inside of you, and it's your responsibility to get the support you need to unleash that. So it's not anybody's responsibility to give you anything. It's your responsibility to seek it out, set your goal, set how much money you want to make. How much money do you want to have in the bank? How, what type of investments do you want to have? How many t-shirts do you want to sell? All these, all these little things, what's going to make you happy? Does, does, that, does, does that resonate at all? Did we lose him? Um, um, He's still I'm listening to uh I'm listening to all the words you say. I'm Okay, brother. Very Thank good. you for calling, man. I really appreciate it. And I, I hope I don't sound like a crazy man. I'm looking for validation. No, 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 please. I, <laughs> when I speak to my family, uh I sound like a crazy man. So I <laughs> when you said that it totally resonated. That was another thing that resonated. So Yeah. Well, I totally understand and I I thank you for uh, taking my call. All right. Much respect. Thanks. Have a good good rest of, good, good rest of the weekend there. All right, you too, brother. Cool. All right, peace out. Yes, yes, Mr. West. I don't know if you got, uh, got to go now, but if anyone else wants to call in now before we close the podcast here, uh, the number is 512. Uh, we got a number calling right now. One second. Why is it not coming out, okay? Yes, call. How are you doing there? Yo, peace and blessing, brother. Cool. How's it going? How you doing there? Man, I'm, I'm good, man. It's brother Aaron Israel, man, calling out of South Carolina. How you doing there? What's your question to comment for uh, Mr. Tika Wales here? Uh, man, I wanted to ask you, man. Um, you know, been been watching movies for a long time, and just in in, in the scene, 
how, have you ever seen another director or anybody with the same zeal as a Robert Townsend? And is that something that's missing out of the scene in the movies? Have you ever seen anybody kind of come close to his ideas that he used to have when he used to make those movies? It was very powerful, by the way. Do you see that happening again? Thank you for calling. Um, when Robert uh, approached me for this this particular movie, when we got on the set, Robert said, I want to create a classic. Mm -hmm. so he planted a seed in all of us and, and, and helped us to dream of something excellent. And we felt good about it and we wanted to come to work and we wanted to work with each other and we wanted to challenge each other and we wanted to be as good as we could. This is our 30th anniversary, by the way, that mm -hmm. we're gonna be celebrating us at the Tribeca Film Festival in New York City wow. on uh, June 19th. But I've seen some other directors who have the quality of excellence. It's not many and mm -hmm. And even Robert has to continuously challenge himself to keep at that level. Because right. sometimes you do something that's great and you didn't. You know, every artist well, I mean, you know, has, to, has to find a way to continue doing that because, it, you know, excellence is, 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 it requires something. Oh, yeah. It's it's a it's a it's it's it requires something that's maniacal, that's fanatical. You know, we talk about Michael Jordan every single day because what he brought right. to the court was something different. What Kobe brought to the court was something different. What LeBron brings to the court is something different. And most of the times when I'm in situations. I'm not getting the best out of myself and the people around me are not getting the best out of themselves. And I have to really dig it out, dig it out and have some type of vision of that's bigger than me. Um, so like I said, Robert planted the seed that we're making a classic and it kind of came true. I don't know if he did that with all of his films. I don't look at all his films and feel that same magic because it's very difficult to do. It takes a lot. I mean, we worked on that movie from February, March, April, May, just in the filming of it. And then the editing, the music, the, the sound, the, the colorization, the re-editing, the dealing with the studios. He had to put a lot of work into that thing, man. And, and, it's shown today. I mean, the Tribeca Film Festival is Robert De Niro's company, and they are honoring mm -hmm. us this year for our 30th anniversary. I haven't been involved in anything like that in my life other than the Five Heartbeats where it's just wow. over and over and over. Maybe the Cosby Show. And unfortunately, the things that uh, Bill has experienced has put a dim light on the Cosby Show but other than that, uh, there's not very many things that I've been involved in that have had that type of life to it. Um, when I was in film school, I went to film school for a while, and there was some, there was some amazing young filmmakers. There's amazing filmmakers out there that you've never heard of yet. Um, when I saw Get Out, the movie Get Out, I said, "This brother knows All what right. he's, he knows what he's doing." What's what's the brother's name who did that? Uh. Uh, Peel. Yeah, that's it. Peel. Yeah. Peel. He's the direction on that, the 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 way the suspense. I was scared out of my mind, man. There are there's some bad yeah, directors yeah. out there. There's some bad directors out there. I mean, in a good way. B A D D. Yeah. Yeah, do, do you feel most that most people are generic though. Remember that. Most people are generic. Are you a director? Right. No, no, I, I deal with uh, choreography. I'm a martial artist by trade. Okay. I'm a musician by standard, but I'm a martial artist by trade. So 
Okay. In my my dealing with the industry, I deal with choreography and POVs, you know, point okay. angles. But from that perspective, when it comes to striking and throwing and stunts and all that kind of good stuff. But I I'm I'm a thespian by like knack. Okay. And then okay. You know, I'm an at home comedian trying to learn the, the art of comedy. So Okay. But I deal with thespianism a lot based upon those um attributes of being able to control the energy and then, then then make that energy um project uh into an audience and then have mm-hmm. that story kind of kind of kind of in, infect them for lack of a better word so you know it creates that 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 connection to the character i like playing antagonist by the way so I'm, okay okay yeah you know, like i like antagonist in role but it, there's have there's you done, there's, have you done there's, film or stage? stage say it again have you done film or stage? Like amateur stuff, you know, right out of college, um, high school stuff. Uh, I've done some independent films. Um, there's a there's a director, a friend of mine from Atlanta. Well, he's actually a guy named, his name is uh, Johnny Blade. And he's done some really good um, films. And I, I was actually a, a starring role in one of his films called The Last October 7th. I think it's out somewhere on YouTube. But, um, okay. Yeah, but I've worked with some really nice, you know, independent directors that, you know, they're really good. So, and I just wanted to post that because I like Robert Townsend and the Five Heart. Um, like he's he's a he's a great person. Not only is he a great he artist, like he's a great person. I mean, everything he's done has kind of just been different than most of the quote unquote black exploitative type. Things. I grew up in the 90s. I was born in the 80s, but you know, that's mm-hmm. when kind of black television was big and you know, Robert Townsend was that guy. So he created good superheroes. He created good stories, something that you can look at and be proud of and not think it's too gimmicky because I like Meteor Man. Great. Yeah, great. Was, yeah. Well, you know, you never know what story is going to touch you. Right. You know what I'm saying? You never know what story or what part of a story it could be one scene in a movie that could transform somebody's life right so right and hey man go for whatever you want to go for how old are you uh, i'm 41 well yeah i'm on a movement right now i got my fiance making shirts like people are not crayon so that's my new movement do your thing man do your thing don't yes, we, don't ask Ken, I you say, what do i need to do what do i need to do to keep doing my dream. That's all, man. And enjoy your life. Thank you for calling, man. Appreciate it. Well, thank, thank you guys, man. Appreciate it. Thank you, brothers. All right. Much respect. Much respect. I think we got one more call in. Uh, uh, Tico, I don't know if you got to go now, but that, that came in. I'm good. Let me, I'm call, good. Him. Let me call him in. Uh, call him back here. One second. See if they pick up. They just called. Yes, yes, you're live. Cool. Uh, I, you just called. How you doing there? What's up, brother man? This is Ollie. How you doing there, uh, Ollie? How you doing? What's your question coming for uh, Mr. Wells here? Oh yeah, primarily, I want to say it has been refreshing to hear from you today. Um, we are actually the same age, <laughs> and. Um, you know, it's it's interesting your perspectives. Um, did you have these perspectives when you first started in your movie careers? Um, it's, it, it it keeps growing. Um, when I when I was uh, uh, in New York in the early '80s, I started getting exposed to thought. I was uh, finishing up at New York University in, in my undergraduate, and I met some people in New York City that changed my life um, in, in spiritually, um, health and nutrition wise. Um, my big brother from another mother, his name is Joe Donaldson. He turned me on to metaphysics and um, got me into reading. And uh, reading heavy books, you know, 
not the mainstream books, but books on thought and books on history of, of, of different kind of thinkers. And then I met a guy named um, Artie Shepard, and he turned me on to, he was my music teacher, but he was also my health teacher. And he was a person who uh, was curing people of different diseases, like Dr. Sabi. He was Dr. Sabi's contemporary. And uh, so I was hanging around a lot of people like that in Harlem and uh, in New York and uh, taking herb classes. I began studying herbology uh, back around 1983, 84. And um, so it's, it's grown. I, I was in and out of Christianity. I met Hebrew Israelites, Muslims, Buddhists, um, uh, you know, not um, uh, Siddha Yoga people, and I, I realized that the the thought patterns that I grew up with in Washington D.C. was only a limited view of what the universe really is, and so I've been on a journey for uh, that got accelerated in the early '80s, and it just keeps morphing, you know. And, and refining and I get more confidence and uh, in my own abilities. Wow, wow, okay. Well, I, it's um, a pleasure to hear you speak and expound on the things that you have learned over the years. I've had similar experiences, um, but life is, is really funny. Um, <laughs> It shows you different things about itself as the days uh, grow on. Um, I have um, experienced quite a bit, um, and not just through my brother, but through my both my brothers, actually. Um, we are very close, um, and um, but through other people as well. I've had to let some people go. I have some people that are still friends. The My circle of influence has decreased over the years. However, I see a new energy arising each day. I, I, it's, it's kind of funny. I saw it in the early 90s, uh, yeah, early to mid 90s. Then I saw a low in it. But over the past three years, I've noticed Things are changing for our people, actually for everybody, but in particular, our people. And I think they're learning some of the things that they should have known um, all along. When I went to South Carolina State. Um, we used to play Howard every year. I didn't learn a thing in college, nothing. I didn't know other than, of course, um, the the academic part, but I, I didn't know anything about myself. And then there were some things that I did begin to learn. They were things that my mother had said and taught me. So I had that stuff all along. So it's interesting. Uh, some of the things that you're talking about. Um, and now I'm coming into more of um, more teachings even now. Right. Right, right, right. And also, uh, I'm, I want to say, I, I'm pretty sure Tico Wells is familiar with Can you with hear me? Us. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Hold on, let me, let me refresh the page. There's something happened. We lost Tico. One second, uh, uh, Mr. Hammett. One second. Can you, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, 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 yes. I, I don't know where. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, we're, we're back here. But, um, yeah, this is Bobby Hemmings. The Hemmings. call came and it knocked me off. Man. Oh, the call knocked okay. I I put it on Do Not Disturb or something. Right, right, right. Yeah, but this is uh, Bobby Hemmings' brother, too. So, you know, he was definitely part of, big part of the metaphysical. And okay, spiritual. can he, can he, uh, can he repeat what he was saying at all? Did we lose uh, yeah, him? Primarily, what I was saying is that in the last three years, I've seen quite a, 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 a shift change. Some things are happening. I know, you know, young brothers like Kulik may not know or understand 
but I definitely see a change in our people about our situation. Um, I don't know if it's because of the internet. I doubt it because I didn't see this kind of thing in the in the early 2000s, and, but I do see things changing for the positive, for the better. And I think it's very powerful what's going on right now. Can Can you hear me, brother? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I, I can't see Kulik, but you, you know, um, you know what happened to me. Um, a couple of things happened to me with the internet thing. Before I really jumped into YouTube, um, a brother named Ashra Quazy. You familiar with Ashra? Oh yeah, I'm quite familiar with Ashra Quazy. Okay, so I was doing a show um, that Will Smith and Jada had produced called All of Us. And the funny thing about the story that was one that's on, that one's on uh, um, Netflix, right? I, I don't know what it's on now, but it, it, it was it used to be on regular network. Dwayne Martin and Lisa Ray were the two stars of it. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And anyway, um, I I got Martin, uh, not Martin. Uh, who uh, I was cast for that show, and. Um, Long story short, they changed my role, and I, I didn't like the role that I got. But Debbie Allen was directing, and I didn't want to quit. And so uh, anyway, I went back into the office of a friend of mine, uh, Laverne, who's related to Jada. And she said, come here, I want to show you something. And she put in some tapes of Ashra Kwesi talking about Kemet and the African origins of, of Christianity. And I said, ah, I was supposed to be here for another reason. Right. <laughs> I sat there, man, and I went through these tapes. I called Ashra. I said, look, man, send me everything you got. And I just ordered all his tapes and stuff. And uh, uh, I always wanted that to know more VHS. about it. Hmm? I said, that was probably VHS. No, it was, it was DVDs. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Oh, DVDs. This was this was two thousand and five. But anyway, so I got into. I always wanted to get into the history of Christianity because it affects so much of our life, the 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 Bible and understanding Christians and blah blah blah. So I got into Kemet. I started learning about Kemet and Rome and all these different things. Then the next year. Uh, after uh, somebody sent me a video called Loose Change about 9-11. And that movie blew me away, blew me away. Things, I always know who has done their research on 9-11 by certain buzzwords. You say Building 7, right. somebody knows about Building 7, you know they just haven't been listening to the mainstream media. So, um, right. so those kind of videos opened up my YouTube world and I became obsessed with YouTube. See, as an actor, I've been mostly unemployed most of my life. So I've had a lot of time on my hands to study and read and things like that. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a geek in that, in that aspect. And Bobby Hammett, I got, I got turned on to Bobby Hammett uh, by some friends of mine. And Bobby, Bobby just can take you and take you and take you and take you and take you out there. Um, you know, um, Phil Valentine, um, real thinkers. <coughs> it doesn't mean that you know, anybody knows everything. That you can say that uh, Bobby's my brother, and <laughs> when people call him thinker and those types of things, <laughs> we grew up together. He's one year younger than me, and he's one year older than my youngest brother. Three of us, and um, <laughs> people. People talk about it, Bobby, and I say, you know, but we all started in consciousness the same, during the same time. Uh, in, in 83, I had graduated from school, and um, uh, like I said, Bobby uh, started at the same time, but where he went with it, I could never go. And it's interesting that you would talk about it. Phil Valentine, I was um, 
in a lecture with Valentine. Um, that was in 92. So these brothers, I, I know personally, and they have been, but I was, I'm always amazed at the hearing my brother talk as if he was brought up in Kemet. <laughs> oh, it's a gift. It's, it's really a gift. And I had to realize that my love for studying was not a gift that everyone was given. So I had to start developing a different type of compassion for people because if I send people a video and say, check this out, they may not have the capacity, the bandwidth to even sit there and deal with that video. You know, you feel what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm the same, same here. Same so here. Phil, you know, Valentine um, could do, Phil Valentine could do a lecture and it lasts all night and you wake up in the morning, he's still talking. Yeah. So Bobby did a um a twenty hour lecture <laughs> and stopped because the people had to go. <laughs> it's it's if we could develop the ability to come back to it, come back to it and come back to it. So through through my experience with YouTube, I call it YouTube University, I've learned so much about life and the world and um uh things like 9-11, things like AIDS, things like the coronavirus. Most people say, well, if it's on the, U on the internet, it can't be true. Well, that's not true. Everything is on there, the good, the bad, and ugly. Well, how do you figure out what's true or not? You don't necessarily figure out what's true. You listen. Right. You listen for consistency. You listen for uh, logic. You listen with your third eye. You listen for spiritual movement, right? And you'll be guided as to what is your path. Right. So I tell people that, uh, you know, I've learned things about 9-11. That doesn't mean I know everything about 9-11. Right. I've learned things about health. That doesn't mean I know everything about health. I'm just not some dude in a barbershop, though, because I put the work in. I put the time in. I know people can't understand what I, when I tell them about coronavirus and Bill Gates and Fauci and what they're up to. I know people can't hear it because they don't do the work. They don't do the work. And once you go down these rabbit holes, people want to just call you a conspiracy theorist because it makes them feel like they've they've dismissed you. They dropped the mic on you. And it's a real kind of unfortunate ignorance that we have where we feel like we just dropped the mic on people when we haven't even began to hear what people are trying to share. It doesn't mean that it's all right or all wrong. Just let's listen to each other. Let's listen to each other. I tell people, read the material that Pfizer puts out there because they put it out there. Read the material that Johnson & Johnson puts out there because they put it out there. And they don't hide from you. Just like on the commercials, they don't hide from this pill could make you go blind, sterile, uh, lose your hair, liver damage, and kidney damage but you might have a four hour erection. They told you, they told you. So Pfizer comes out with, hey, this is COVID-19 and these are the side effects. And yes, they look identical. We told you, we told you, you didn't read the package. You didn't ask your doctor right. what the hell was in it. To say, uh, yes, and death, and yeah, just keep talking. I'm like, wow, they're telling you this could kill you. They tell you. They told that, you know, one of the side effects of the, of the vaccines, they say, is death. They tell you. I don't know what happened to Hank Aaron after he took it. I don't know what happened to Marvin, Marvelous Marvin Hagler after he took it. But people don't do research, but yet they want to act like they're very intelligent in their choices, but they won't do any research. And it's right there for you. It's not conspiracy theory to read the label. 
That's not a conspiracy theory. Not at all. I tell, I ask people all the time, what are natural flavors? I keep seeing this on packaging. Oh my even, goodness. Even stuff that they say I, is supposed I, to be I've actually healthy. I called the manufacturer and say, listen, natural flavor, What? what is that? I can't go outside and pick a natural flavor off the ground out of the out of the dirt. What the hell is a natural flavor? My brother, my other brother, um, he is an herbologist. And he tells me we we talk all the time. He would say, What are natural flavors? What is it? I forgot the excuse that because we used to call the um, the manufacturer, and they were like, well, this is so-and-so. I said, well, why don't you list that? I don't know what this is. It says natural flavor. What the hell is a natural flavor? <laughs> One, it protects them from people knowing all of their secrets. And two, when people see the word natural, they go to sleep. Their mind shuts down. When people hear the word vaccine, they think that it's something beneficial. So they don't have to ask questions because the government loves me. They wouldn't harm me. So there's certain buzzwords that industries use. In, in my industry in Hollywood, they say it's based on a true story. They didn't say a true story. They said, based on a true story. So for instance, the last King of Scotland, where, um, uh, what's his name played? Uh, Idi Amin, Forrest Whitaker. They inserted this white character that did not exist in history, but he was a major player in that movie. Now a young person, not even just a young person, a person watching that movie, they won't think that that person was just created out of the blue they will think that happened. That's history. It's not a historical movie. It's a good movie. I enjoyed it. It's not a historical movie. Spike Lee's movie, Malcolm X, beautiful movie. It's not a historical movie. Right. It's based on Malcolm X's life. So in the autobiography of Malcolm X, it said, Malcolm X says, my brother turned me on to Islam. In the movie, there was a guy in prison with Malcolm X that turned him on. So we have an opportunity to start waking up slowly and asking questions that might be in our benefit so that we can live the life of the true spirit beings that we are. And it's fun. It's fun. It's, it's a pleasure, man. Tell uh, Bobby Hammett uh, I have the best regards for him. All right. I'll see him this week, actually. Okay. Because he's in Atlanta. I'm in Birmingham. Okay. Bless you, man. Bless you. Likewise. Peace. Much respect. Peace. Yes, yes. This has been a great, wonderful, uh, nourishing podcast. Uh, we got to do this again, Mr. Wales. Um Leave the people uh, what you'll be doing in the future. I know you talked about it earlier before, but um, what you'll be doing in the future and um, any social media, any contact you want to leave with them. No, I don't want to leave any contact with social media, but I will say this. Any subject that you want to know about is available. Anything you want to do and create is available. And the person that you have to ask for permission is in the mirror. Kanye West said that he thought slavery was a choice. And I say a choice is only a choice if you're conscious that you have a choice. And I got that from Eckhart Tolle. A choice is only a choice if you're aware. If a million dollars is underneath my rug and I don't know about it, it's almost the same as 
not having it. So ask questions, read labels, and create the being that you want to create. And remember, reality is usually given to us by those who want to control us. It's only reality because we agree that it's reality. Many realities have been dispelled. There was a time when we only dreamed of being able to talk on this little box right here, this little box that we call a cell phone. Now we got pictures, we got video, we got all kinds of streaming, all kinds of stuff. This was in somebody's mind. It didn't always exist. Flying didn't always exist as we know it as humans. So what you think is not possible may be possible. And, and that's in every area, every field. So that's what I want to leave the people with. Um, I have nothing to sell you. I have nothing to uh, convince you of. I have nothing to uh, save you with. You have everything you need. I'm just a support. I'm a servant to myself and humanity. And um, I want to do beneficial things in the time that I have on this planet. That's all I want to say. And I want to thank you, brother, for giving me this opportunity to share myself and to share what um, has been given to me. So keep doing what you're doing, man. Keep doing the good work. And and uh, we'll talk soon. Much respect and have a good rest of the weekend. All right. Peace. Peace out.